Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I'm so sorry I couldn't join you in person, but I'm honored to welcome you to the fifth annual Better Angels Student History Film Festival. Congratulations to the six student winners of the Next Generation Angels Award. We will screen the winning films in a few minutes, followed by interviews with the winners. But before I get to that, I want to talk about the 2022-23 National History Day theme, Frontiers in History, People, Places, Ideas. This theme invites us to explore the many frontiers that have shaped our world, from changing physical frontiers to intellectual and cultural frontiers that have pushed the boundaries of our understanding and our imagination. Throughout history, people have been driven to explore new worlds, new ideas, and new ways of thinking. And it's through their stories that we can gain a better understanding of our past and perhaps even a stronger foundation to understand the world that is emerging. That's why I'm excited to see these young filmmakers tackling such important topics. They're exploring everything from the frontiers of scientific discovery to the frontiers of cultural preservation. I'd like to thank the Better Angels Society and our partners, the Library of Congress, the Philadelphia Film Society, and National History Day for each playing a vital role in bringing these award-winning films to thousands of students all over the United States. Congratulations again to the winners and to all who submitted films in last year's competition. So let's dive into the Next Generation Angels Award films and explore the many frontiers that have shaped our world. Thank you. Welcome, I'm Patrick Mitling, head of the recorded sound section at the Library of Congress and your Master of Ceremonies for the Next Generation Angels Awards 5th Annual Student History Film Festival. Today we embark on a unique cinematic journey that celebrates the incredible talents of young filmmakers. Just like any prestigious film festival, we'll be screening a collection of remarkable documentaries. However, what sets this event apart is the fact that each of these captivating films is only 10 minutes long and were crafted by middle and high school students. Yes, students just like you. During this event, you'll have the opportunity to not only watch these insightful documentaries, but also witness interviews with their talented creators, the filmmakers themselves, conducted by yours truly. We'll delve deep into what inspired these young talents, how they approached their research, the way they meticulously analyzed historical materials and information, and the creative process that brought their visions to life. Prepare to be amazed and inspired by the unexpected discoveries they've made along the way. Through this film festival, we aim to showcase how history can be brought to life through the captivating medium of film, using the very materials we cherish and preserve at the Library of Congress. We hope you'll discover that history is not only cool and intriguing, but also a place where young minds can brilliantly shine as historians, filmmakers, and artists. These remarkable students have embarked on a journey of curiosity, unearthing intriguing fragments of the past and piecing them together through meticulous research, analysis, hard work, and boundless creativity. Their films are a testament to their passion for exploring the untold stories of American history. Perhaps after witnessing the work of these young filmmakers today, you too might be inspired to embark on your own creative journey. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the next great historian or filmmaker. The medium is ready and waiting for you to leave your mark. Without further ado, Let's dive into this extraordinary showcase of historical exploration. 
Welcome to the Student History Film Festival, part of the Next Generation Angels Award, hosted by the Better Angels Society. Now I'd like to introduce our first film, the third place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition, the Papunya Tula Art Movement, crossing the frontier from ephemeral indigenous Australian art to cultural preservation, directed by Maya Lim Laurie, eighth grade student at the Singapore American School in Singapore. I'd born in the tea under the tree. We don't write, write him the story in the book, you know, with the pen. We paint him with the story. We paint the land, you know, our country. Separate story. One mother's, one father's country. As the oldest surviving culture in the world, created over 60,000 years ago, Indigenous Australian dreamings were traditionally represented ephemerally imprinted on natural surfaces such as bark, sand, or on the body, soon to be lost to time. However, a shift in this medium in 1971 to more permanent contemporary materials transformed this frontier in art and culture forever. From 1971 to 1972, at the Papunya Reserve in Central Australia, a critical period of Indigenous Australian cultural preservation took place. Through the unintentional gathering of a small pioneering group of Indigenous Australian artists, a widespread shift in artistic medium from natural surfaces to permanent board eventually resulted in the rise to prominence of the Papunya Tula art movement. This concerted shift to a new medium transformed their art into a permanent form that could be presented and sold to a wider audience. Against the immense forces of colonization and assimilation, the artists of Papunya preserved their people, their land, and their cultural stories through art, crossing a pivotal frontier in Indigenous Australian cultural preservation and changing the face of contemporary art forever. The Papunya Tula Art Movement, crossing the frontier from ephemeral Indigenous Australian art to cultural preservation. Since the British colonization of Australia in 1788, Indigenous Australians have faced outright discrimination and the loss of their land, rights, and way of life. Similar to the forced destruction and assimilation of Native Americans throughout U.S. history through policies that resulted in tragedies such as the Trail of Tears and the Native American boarding schools, the Australian government attempted to assimilate the Indigenous population by resettling them into government-mandated reserves and molding them into the dominant white culture. With over 80% of their population decreasing from 1788 to 1970, Indigenous Australians faced the erasure of their culture and suffered the forcible removal of children from their families. In fact, up until the 1967 referendum, Indigenous Australians were not considered citizens of their own country. In 1860, drought and the encroaching pastoral industry pushed more Indigenous Australians out of the desert and onto reserves. In 1959, Papunya was set up to resettle Indigenous Australians. In the early 1970s, Papunya attracted over 1,500 people to the reserve, more than twice the amount it was meant to contain. Groups speaking different languages, practicing different customs, and sometimes even warring tribes were forced together in unfamiliar and confronting circumstances. The true intentions of the Australian government's actions were unbeknownst to many Indigenous people. They came in because they were hungry. They didn't know they could not go back. Arriving from several distinct areas of Central Australia, the Indigenous people came with dreaming stories specific to their land and tribe. The immense cultural variety in such a densely populated area led to serendipitous cultural transactions between different tribes that were eventually translated onto canvas. The artists began painting to assert their unique cultural identity. This intense gathering of ideas and merging of stories demonstrated a diversity and profoundness in Indigenous Australian art that the world had never seen before. In 1971, Geoffrey Barton, a Caucasian schoolteacher from Sydney, Australia, came to teach art to the Indigenous children at the Papani School. Noticing their cultural designs on the sand, Barton realized they had an entire complex culture that was yet to be recognized. Barton encouraged the children to paint their designs on paper inspiring some Papunya men to want to paint as well. This eventually led to the now famous Honey Ant Mural, which boldly represented indigenous agency in the reserves. Barden facilitated this artistic development with supplies and space, helping to define an important moment in the history of the Papunya Tula art movement. 
other men came to him and said, you know, could you please um, help us? We would like to, to paint our stories. Can you help us with some of the paints and, and things that, you know, you can give us and we will show you by painting for you what we know about our dreaming. The efforts of Jeffrey Barden can be compared to the pioneering work of Dorothy Dunn at the Santa Fe Indian School in New Mexico from 1932 to 1937. She insisted her art students cultivate their own Native American art style. Pushing against decades of cultural assimilation policies, Dunn may have played a crucial role in the development of the art movement in Santa Fe, but the artists revolutionized their form of indigenous art. Although Jeffrey Barden was an integral part of Papunya, the determination and talents of the artists sustained the movement. Amid the casual racism of Australian society, it was undoubtedly easier to accept a hero named Jeff than one named Jangala, Japlajari, Japangati, or Jungurai. Among the artists, Kappa Jampit Jimpa played a crucial role in the Papanya Tuba art movement. Prior to Barden's arrival in 1971, Kappa had already painted on more permanent found objects. His surprise win at the Caltech's Northern Territory Art Award in 1971 marked a critical juncture at which Indigenous Australian art gained official recognition, elevating Kappa's role in the crossing of this artistic and cultural frontier. This recognition confirmed for Kappa and the other artists of Papania that their art had value and was appreciated by an outside audience. The symbols in Indigenous art demonstrate their connection to nature, U-shaped symbols around a concentric circle could represent a group of people sitting around a fire or water hole. Other symbols could represent animal tracks. Excited by the prospect of expressing who they were, where they came from, and potential financial gain, the artists produced over 1,000 paintings during this intense period of creativity between 1971 and 1972. It's more better we do painting on uh, big canvas. Because if we do body painting, and it's disappeared, and it's wrong. You know? Even on the sand painting, when we do sand painting, sand it disappeared again, you know, because wind blow and it's destroyed. While on the canvas, it's now for us that we know it's better to show the world that we're doing the drawing on the canvas. So they can stay on the canvas for years and years. However, the imagery on the Papanya canvases did not come without controversy. Some of the early paintings revealed sacred dreamings only meant to be passed down to initiated members within the community. It was never clear if the early paintings of Papanya involved such discussions. The language barrier between Jeffrey Barton and the artists likely caused this, as he encouraged them to create powerful paintings, which may have been misinterpreted as sacred symbols that held deep spiritual meaning. Nevertheless, many artists found ways around the controversy and continued painting dreamings and making money while respecting their cultural traditions. By using techniques such as overdotting and stippling to conceal secret designs, the artists prevented what could have easily been the downfall of the Papanya Tula art movement. The initial impact of the movement led to the formation of a business cooperative. With indigenous artists elected to leadership positions, the artists had a stake and a say in the sales of their artworks. The eventual success of the Papanya Tula Art Company inspired other Indigenous Australian artists to pursue similar endeavours. Drawn in by the paintings for their captivating complexity, this art form has defied tribal or ethnic labels and has gained the attention of museums and contemporary art collectors. The widespread recognition of this art form today allows for a new generation of Indigenous Australian artists to continue their work critically supporting communities and families financially while preserving their cultural stories for generations to come. The National Gallery in Canberra is the new owner of a painting by Clifford Possum Japuljari, which sold for $2.4 million overnight, a world record price for Aboriginal art. And the final call at $2 million to buy a 158. Demonstrating the viability of this new artistic frontier, in 2007, an Indigenous Australian painting by Papanya Tula artist Clifford Possum Japaljari sold for 2.4 million Australian dollars. This moment marked a significant public recognition of this art form's artistic excellence and cultural value. The Papanya Tula art movement arose out of the ashes of colonization, where the remnants of the oldest surviving culture lay damaged by decades of oppression. With their land taken from them, their nomadic lifestyle was usurped by the promise of a better life. 
The collective actions of a group of Indigenous Australians putting brush to canvas over a two-year span created an art movement that revolutionized the trajectory of their history as well as art itself. Through the Papanya Tula art movement, Indigenous Australian artists managed to survive and thrive despite the racism against Indigenous people. Against all the odds, Indigenous Australian art has become a frontier to showcase their unique world's view while preserving their dreamings in a form that transcends language and time. Maya, first, let me congratulate you on an amazing documentary. Uh, I learned so very much from uh, watching this film, and I'm really happy that I get a chance to talk to you about this today. And so my first question just was, how did the Papunya Tula art movement become what you knew you wanted to focus on in this for this year's History Day competition? Well, it was very difficult to decide on a topic, actually, because I have a wide range of interests. Um, so my teacher actually recommended that I visit this exhibit on Indigenous Australian art at the National Gallery of Singapore, because he thought it was interesting and might be a good topic to focus on. So I visited this museum and I was just captivated by all of the artwork. And the more I looked into this art form, the more I wanted to learn more about it and the artists behind it. And after choosing this main idea of Indigenous Australian art, I it took a while for me to discover the frontier because there are so many different frontiers to focus on. There's the frontier of art, there's the physical desert frontier of Australia, and there's the frontier of cultural preservation. And I eventually decided to focus on cultural preservation because I felt it had the most overarching effect on the lives of Indigenous Australians and other Australians, and it taught an important lesson about Indigenous communities worldwide and their rights and culture. So that I picked up on that throughout the 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 documentary, and I think one thing that I think might have been there, but I'm not sure, and so I'm going to ask the question: Is you were discussing uh, Professor Barden and his role in the popularization, I suppose, or the sort of shift in modality of of the Papunya Tula art movement? And could you speak a little bit to the controversy that? may have been in other sources that more centered him in the importance in the art. Yeah. So in my documentary, I talk about it a lot. I mention Jeffrey Barden, who was a Caucasian art teacher from Sydney, who came to Papania to help the artists with supplies and encouragement. And I originally thought of him as the main contributor to the movement because that's what most sources say he is. He's like the singular hero. Um, but the, the more I researched and found books and articles portraying different perspectives, the more I realized that it was the artists who actually played the most crucial roles, roles towards this movement. And the turning point was when I read this book by Vivian Johnson called Once Upon a Time in Papania, where she described how some of the artists, such as Kappa, Jampa Jimpa, played a crucial role towards the success of the movement. What, uh, in your, when you were putting the documentary together, uh, there are such great visuals, not only from the artwork itself, but from uh, the interview that you conducted, as well as the other documentaries that you you put together. And so making a documentary about art, how did you balance the information with showing these stunning visuals? What was your artistic process for, for putting this together? Well, I definitely wanted to include um, a lot of the paintings, especially the paintings that were created at the time of my project. Um, but 
yeah, I think it was also very important to add primary sources of the artist's painting and the historical context of my story. Do you have a favorite piece of artwork that you either saw at the gallery or that you learned about uh, through your research? Yeah, so there's a painting by Clifford Possum Jeppel Jerry that I included in my documentary as the painting that won $2.4 million or that was sold for $2.4 million at an auction in 2007. And it was a really important moment for the movement um, that showed how much this movement has progressed and how much the art form had progressed. And yeah, I actually saw this painting when I went to the exhibit at the National Gallery of Singapore. And it was really, it was a beautiful painting. One of the things I loved about the documentary was that it highlighted the community, not only of the artists, but of the meaning behind the art as well. And so when you were talking about they came together to make the to, to make these pieces of art and they talked to, you talked about a cooperative that was set up. Um, how much did that cooperative help sustain the success of the art movement through the financial support or the moral or the uh, community support that you found through your research? Yeah, so this cooperative was very important to the success of the movement because it was really what began the Papanya Tula Art Company, which still continues to thrive and support Indigenous Australian artists. And it was since Indigenous Australian artists were given leadership roles in this cooperative, it was also very significant because it represented um, indigenous agency in reserves. I, I like that phrase, the, the indigenous agency that you bring up there. You start the documentary by discussing the colonization uh, of the indigenous peoples. And so I wanted to sort of touch briefly on that topic where how do you see or how did you find the establishment of the artwork for the indigenous community in that frame. Um, well, as when the Papanya Tula Art Cooperative was originally formed, it was not given, it had a lot of ups and downs at some periods, it was, thriving and at some periods when, for example, when Jeffrey Barden left, it went down a little bit. Um, but as it gained popularity, as the movement gained popularity throughout Australia and the world, um, the Papanya Tula Art Company could have more access to materials and access to going to exhibits all across Australia and worldwide. Maya, I wanna thank you for taking the opportunity to, to talk with me. And um, I wanted to say this was a very powerful uh, documentary that uh, I did not know about this art movement. I had seen art, but I did not know that it was part of this larger movement. And I really appreciate the thought and, um, and creativity that you put into your documentary. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Next is the second place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition, Pearl Kendrick, the pioneering researcher who ended a deadly plague, directed by Jay Patel, seventh grade student at Jericho Middle School in Jericho, New York. A mysterious, highly contagious disease causing children to violently cough was first discovered in the Middle Ages. In Italy, it was known as dog bark. In England, Shinnerkin cough. And in China, the 100-day cough. And it spread without warning. Within America, it became known as the whooping cough for its distinct sound. 
and in the 1930s, it killed more infants in the United States than polio, measles, and tuberculosis combined. At the height of the Great Depression, with limited funding, Dr. Pearl Kendrick researched and developed the first successful pertussis vaccine, a new frontier in disease prevention. Her achievement in adding this life-saving vaccine to standard inoculations for infants was a trailblazing advancement that vastly increased the U.S. life expectancy for children, saving millions of lives. This success against all odds by a pioneering female researcher has inspired future generations of women to pursue careers in science. According to the National Library of Medicine, in the late 1800s, scientists had developed vaccines to control many infectious diseases, including smallpox and typhoid fever. However, this new frontier of medical advancements inspired public policies that were not without criticism. In 1879, the Anti-Vaccination Society of America was founded, concerned over the perceived violation of personal liberty and choice. As work in microbiology continued to progress, the bacteria Bordetella pertussis, which causes whooping cough, was discovered in Belgium by Jules Bordet and Octave Jango in 1906. By 1914, pharmaceutical companies in the United States sold many pertussis and mixed serum pertussis vaccines made to both treat and prevent whooping cough. However, they were not effective and children were still dying. In 1929, just 10 years after World War I ended, the Great Depression began and left many Americans in poverty. Across the country, people could not find food, jobs, or health care. This led to poor living conditions and increased the circulation of disease, escalating the need for public health care and preventative medicine. In addition, while educational opportunities for women had risen, a lack of employment opportunities for women remained. Public health was one of the few scientific areas that had begun to seek out educated women, as it was considered mindless rote work and paid less. Pearl Kendrick, a newly graduated female bacteriologist, took a position working at the Michigan Department of Health Laboratory as a branch chief, determined to make a difference on this frontier for disease prevention. In the 1930s, whooping cough was one of the most serious diseases of young children, killing approximately 6,000 children per year in the United States alone. Kendrick, a survivor of whooping cough as a child, was steadfast in her desire to stop the disease. However, she struggled to acquire funding to research vaccine development. With help from her colleague Grace Eldering and volunteers, they began working on their own time collecting specimens for Bordetella pertussis. Now this was at the time of the Great Depression in the early 1930s. And we learned about the Depression as we learned about whooping cough. And we had a watchword after a while. It was around to the back and up the stair. And many of these families were very poor with the fathers out of work. And we collected our specimens by the light of kerosene lamps. We'd find a whole family of whooping, coughing, vomiting, strangling children. And the idea was to open this plate of red medium with the blood in it and let the child cough so the spray fell on the medium. Kendrick and Eldering started running tests. 1,592 kids were involved and 712 kids received a vaccine, while another 880 served as controls. I felt scared to death, Kendrick admitted. The trial was successful. Of the group that got vaccinated, only four mild cases were reported. Due to previous disappointments with earlier pertussis vaccines, the medical establishment was skeptical of the results. The esteemed male epidemiologist Wade Hampton Frost doubted the validity of the trial, stating, The odds are strongly against Miss Kendrick's experiment being sound. On the heels of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt enacted the New Deal in 1933, which consisted of programs like the Works Progress Administration, or WPA a project to help stabilize the economy. This legislation would prove to be necessary to many Americans, including medical researchers like Pearl Kendrick. In 1936, when they were desperate for funds and their research was in jeopardy, Kendrick astutely brought First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, a human rights pioneer, to the lab to advocate for her public health work. And we had help of the WPA, Works Progress Administration, 
and uh, we don't allow people to uh, say bad things about the WPA because <laughs> we couldn't have done this study, absolutely couldn't have done it, without the help that we got from the WPA. In 1939, after securing the funding, Kendrick once again showed her pioneering spirit by assembling a diverse team of researchers. This group included Loni Clinton Gordon, an African-American woman who was having difficulty finding employment due to racial and gender discrimination. Gordon supported pertussis research at the Grand Rapids lab where she contributed in isolating an especially harmful strain of pertussis that made an even more effective vaccine than the first. I knew what my mission was to be, to help find the culture with sufficient diet virulence to make the vaccine. In 1944, the American Medical Association added Kendrick's pertussis vaccine to the list of recommended immunizations, and pertussis cases began dropping rapidly. In 1948, the United States combined three vaccines into the DPT vaccine, which protected against diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Kendrick was chosen to promote international vaccine standards in Latin America and the Soviet Union from the World Health Organization. In later years, doctors Kendrick and Eldering combined the DPT vaccine with the inactivated poliovirus vaccine, or IPV. The merging of these two vaccines dramatically dropped the amount of required injections. Overall deaths dropped from 7,518 in 1934 to just 10 a year by the early 1970s. Anti-vaccination sentiment faded throughout the Great Depression, but never fully disappeared as there was controversy over the safety of the pertussis vaccine. Despite the development of life-saving vaccines today, there is a small but growing backlash against childhood vaccinations, including pertussis. This reluctance can be attributed to opinions spread on social media, the fear of side effects, religious beliefs, and more. As a result, childhood diseases continue to spread. Reported cases of pertussis in the U.S. have more than doubled already in this century, from 7,867 in 2000 to 18,617 and 7 deaths in 2019. Recently, there was a whooping cough outbreak in New York, resulting in 12 cases. We have a health alert for you this morning. Rockland County officials now say there are 12 cases of whooping cough in the county. News 12 is told nine kids are under the age of five. The rest are between five and 10 years old. Only one of the children, we're told, has a record of being vaccinated. Shying from the public eye, Kendrick never sought credit for her pioneering vaccine work. Nevertheless, she and her team proved that women could research and develop successful vaccines. In 2017, the percentage of women in STEM grew to 27% due to increasing education and employment opportunities for female scientists. Her tenacity in securing funding and work ethic is exemplified by female biochemist Catalin Carico, who helped develop the COVID-19 vaccine. The life expectancy for children worldwide has increased due to the vaccine developed by Dr. Kendrick. And her work with the World Health Organization has paved the way for eventual eradication of pertussis. After Kendrick's, uh, Kendrick's death in 1980, a tribute written to her said, quote, a life saved by prevention cannot even be identified. Who are the men and women living today who would be dead from whooping cough had it not been for Pearl Kendrick's vaccine? Today, Dr. Pearl Kendrick is remembered for her relentless spirit toward developing and standardizing the life-saving pertussis vaccine, a new frontier in disease prevention. Hi, Jay. Thank you so much for your documentary and congratulations on your award. Uh, I wanted to start off by asking um, what what inspired you to make a documentary uh, uh, about Dr. Kendricks? Yeah, so um, at my school, we have a history research club and I was entering seventh grade. It was the first time I had um, 
uh, I could go to this club. And their whole goal is to um, provide people the, all the tools and everything to participate in History Day. So I thought that would be a great um, first step. And um, when there, I started looking for topics. At first, I really wanted to do something obscure, something not many people have heard about. And for some reason, that would always take me to um, political topics. I don't really know why, but that's really what happened. And um, thinking about it, I wasn't really interested in politics, and I feel like that wouldn't really be a good um, topic for me. So I kind of like rerouted everything, and I decided to find a topic more connected to me, and that was medicine. And where I, um, when I thought about medicine, something like clicked in my head, and I really I went into vaccines. So um, with further more research, I found Dr. Kendrick, and really connected all these loose ties. She was extremely obscure. Not any, really, no one heard of her. The only, all my doctors, nobody, nobody has um, heard of her. The only person that has was actually from the Long Island National, uh, Long Island History Day competition. There's one uh, professor that was my judge. Out of everybody, the uh, only one person has heard of her. So I thought that was, you know, really almost a little strange. I, I have to admit I had not either, but uh, I've, uh, I have, had several Tdap boosters, um, and so I do thank her for her work. One of the things I want, one of the things that jumped out at me right away, uh, watching your documentary, was the quote that you included um, from uh, Wade Hampton Frost. And I wanted to ask, what in your research, what was behind the comment that? her work was not sound when trying to find a cure to whooping cough. Yeah, so um, at the time, especially, and being a, women, a woman, really all the odds are against her. No one thought that she could possibly achieve this. You know, at this time, a lot of men were even trying to do this and had uh, literally lost all hope. It was something that, it was a big problem, and a lot, no, really no one had, um, had success in trying to find a solution. So what really happened was that this one person came out of nowhere um, with very little funding, really almost a barely even operating laboratory setting. And she comes in and thinks that she will be able to solve this um, whooping cough pandemic. And nobody believes in her. Nobody thinks she can do it. And I, um, again, I feel like um, at that time, I could see how that was happening. But especially like today, things have really changed. And I still can't believe that under all those, under all that pressure and these circumstances, she was still able to prevail and accomplish something this um, huge. One of the things I absolutely loved about uh, your documentary, and I, I paused the screen to see if I could make out any of the, the entries in it, but seeing Dr. Kendrick's journal uh, at, at Special Collections or at the, the University Library, how did that affect, uh, or how did you decide to include that in your documentary? Yeah, so um, at the later stages of my project, I realized that I really just keep talking about her and I don't show any of her work. So um, I actually contacted the um, Grand Rapids Public Library. They are the ones that supplied me with her journal. They really su supplied me with a lot of great primary source resources. So um, I thought it would be a great idea to put her piece of work in there to show the audience that this is what she's been doing, that she's been putting effort into it. And I thought it'd be just like a really nice touch. It, it really was, and it really hit sandwiched in between the archival video, the archival film of her talking about her discovery, and then also the uh, audio of uh, Lonely Gordon. Uh, how did you come across that audio? Yeah, so... Um, also, while I was researching, I thought it was great. It would be a great idea to have some of her, um, some of her voice. So I, um, I reached out to um, Dustin Dwyer. He was a producer in that area of Grand Rapids. He, um, I found out through this one website that he actually had interviewed Loni Gordon, and I contacted him for permission to use that, um, to use the interview. So he sent that over to me, and again, I thought it would just be a great touch to add in that interview. Since really from, um, I just feel like overall, just having their voice in it just makes it like really like that much elevated. 
and it gives them like personality. So I thought that was a great touch. Um, he sent that over and um, the audio was a little bit shaky. So I had to put it into like this voice editor and kind of balance everything I could. But I'm really happy um, how it turned out. So you had said at the top that you really didn't, you kept coming up with political ideas uh, and didn't want to, uh, didn't want to follow that through and you ended up in vaccines, which you do touch on the topic of anti-vaccination movements as well as misinformation. And how important was it for you in this story of Dr. Kendrick and her colleagues to include that through line of how important the work she was doing was to, uh, to the time that we live now? Um, yeah, so on that point of anti-vaccination, I thought that would also just give another great perspective in the story. And um, I also feel like Pearl Kendrick's work really, um, it also gave another perspective to those of on the side of anti-vax. Since the odds of you getting this vaccine and um, something harmful happening to you while you getting this vaccine and you benefiting to its and not getting this, um, not getting whooping cough again, it was like those numbers are staggering. I feel like the amount of cases um, where people have taken this vaccine and had harmful outcomes to the amount of people that have had this vaccine and have uh, benefited from it, the numbers are really wild. And it's there's a lot of people that have benefited from this. What is something that through your research utterly shocked you to find out? Yeah, um, I talked about this previously, but I feel like um, with her circumstances and um, the fact that no one was able to do this in her time um, and she still had the motivation to keep trying, she um, was able to get funding from like Eleanor Roosevelt. She was able to develop a safe laboratory. She was able to get all these people in here. She was even able to get um, all, even women too to work with her. And I feel like just at this time period with these kind of circumstances, the fact that she was able to pull all of this together, again, it's like just really, really interesting. And I just can't believe she's done it. Well, your excitement for the topic definitely came through in the documentary, uh, Jay. So I want to thank you again and congratulations on your award. Yeah, thank you. Next is first place winner in the junior division of the National History Day competition. Listen, world, how Elsie Robinson changed American newspapers. Directed by Elena Weintz, eighth grade student at Mid-South Gifted Academy in Collierville, Tennessee. When Elsie Robinson moved to San Francisco with her son early in the 20th century, she wasn't planning to change the world. She started a children's column out of desperation because, as a single mother with an asthmatic son, she needed money. But Elsie ended up doing more than simply providing for herself and her son. She ended up changing America forever. Elsie Robinson changed the American newspaper business by becoming America's most read woman, crossing frontiers on women in the workplace and being hired by William Randolph Hearst when the newspaper business was male-dominated. Because Robinson used her position to influence her readers and change their opinions, she is an important pioneer who pushed frontiers for women in the workplace and fought for equal rights for all races and genders. Elsie grew up in a frontier town called Benicia, California. Her family stayed away from the saloons and bars on the west side of town, going to Sunday school and wearing conservative Victorian clothes. Elsie summed up her family as nice people in her autobiography. Although Elsie's older siblings went to college, her family fell into financial trouble and could not send Elsie to school. Instead of college, Elsie did what was expected of a young lady from a family of nice people in the early 1900s. She married a wealthy East Coaster. Christy B. Crowell proposed after knowing Elsie for a few months, but his parents had reservations about the outspoken 19-year-old from California. Elsie was sent to finishing school in 1902 before marrying Crowell in 1903. Elsie's marriage to Crowell coincided with a time when women had no right to divorce, keep their wages, or secure equal pay, topics she would later write about in her columns. In her autobiography, Elsie wrote, Women had few more rights, and hardly as much value, as a good Jersey cow. Wives could be legally beaten, could be thrown out penniless if they refused any of a husband's rights. Elsie also said she was furiously enraged by things that didn't bother anyone else, meaning that in addition to not being happy with the rights she had as a housewife, 
Elsie was keenly aware of other injustices in society. During Elsie's marriage, the Victorian era came to an end, and the changes that came during the Progressive Era, including the ongoing fight for greater rights for women, showed no signs of stopping. Organizations were founded to help women earn political recognition and power, but they were limited. Even though women earned the right to vote in 1920, only the white upper class would enjoy the new freedom. Later in her life, Elsie would write about racial barriers and equal rights for all races, but during her marriage, writing served as an escape. Crowell was never loving or talkative with Elsie, him being 10 years older than her. The only good thing Elsie got out of her marriage was her son, George, who was born with severe asthma and was prone to coughing fits. Elsie found a respite in writing and even published some of her writing in 1911. After being hired to illustrate a few children's books the following year, Elsie gained the courage to leave her husband and move back to California in 1912. Elsie and Christy officially divorced in 1917. Elsie moved to San Francisco in 1918 to find work. She desperately needed a job. George and Elsie often went to bed hungry, and George needed medicine for his asthma. Whenever Elsie looked in the paper for work wanted advertisements, she saw Young Women Wanted or Organized Girls Wanted for jobs as servants, bookkeepers, and domestic workers. Instead of working as a young, organized woman, Elsie walked into the office of the Oakland Tribune and suggested she start a children's column. Elsie brought in a sample of her writing the next day and was offered a contract to start a column titled Aunt Elsie's Magazine. In her letter introducing herself to the children, she wrote, I will write you a letter, all your very own, that will make you know that my arm is around you and that I love you very much. Children could write to Elsie with stories to be published, questions seeking advice, or drawings to be entered in competitions. Elsie influenced the lives of the children she wrote to and became a source of inspiration to them. Aunt Elsie clubs sprang up throughout California with members receiving a pin and getting to ride in parades. While Elsie didn't believe in hammering and morals, she still encouraged children to be their best. One young boy wrote a poem demonstrating this perfectly. When I was reading your letter, I thought and thought again, and I thought I could do better, and so I tried again. Elsie had the effect of a wise woman to look up to, and she was a positive figure in the lives of children. Because Elsie influenced children so much, parents started writing to Elsie. Elsie's publisher allowed her to start advice columns, her most successful being Cry on Geraldine's Shoulder. The advice was mostly for women on makeup, men, and cleaning. Over time, the questions sent in became more and more controversial, such as women in the workplace or divorce. Elsie wrote to one woman, If a married woman has a talent to contribute to the world, she should not be made to linger at the kitchen sink, peeling spuds and hiding her light under a bushel, as it were. She has a right to develop her own individuality if it takes her out of the home to do it. Elsie's straightforward style drew attention from the San Francisco Call and its publisher, William Randolph Hearst. Hearst's love of truth made him a target for threats, but it also made Elsie Robinson appealing to the San Francisco Call. Hearst contacted Elsie in 1923, offering her a yearly salary of about $5,000, equivalent to $85,000 today. Elsie accepted and started Tell It to Elsie, the Call's version of Cry on Geraldine's Shoulder. Elsie also started Listen World, her most influential and controversial column sharing her views against sexism, racism, and anti-Semitism. Arthur Brisbane, a close friend of Hearst, saw Elsie's column and invited her to Manhattan. Brisbane ran the Evening Journal, one of Hearst's popular East Coast papers with about a million readers. At this time, it was reported that one in four Americans read a Hearst paper, and millions more read his syndicates. Brisbane offered Elsie a yearly salary of $20,000, equivalent to $335,000 today, to publish her columns in the Evening Journal. Elsie accepted. At the height of her career, Elsie had over 20 million readers and was the highest paid woman in Hearst's paper empire. Elsie influenced millions of adults by making her readers think about what they accepted as normal. For example, when confronted about her choice to become a working mother, she wrote, Of your mother, do you think she would have been a wiser guide if she had taken a more active part in the outside world? Elsie used arguments her readers could identify with, in this case challenging a mother's role. Elsie argued that if a mother's part is to guide, she must know the world she is guiding her children through. Elsie conditioned her readers for the coming feminist movement. When a woman wrote in venting her frustrations that advertisements for women were focused on men, saying things like, buy this for your man, Elsie wrote back, I've belonged to, lived with, and written for our female sex for nigh on a 51 years, lady. I started in when we rated mighty low as domestic chattels, and I saw the bright dawning of our so-called emancipation. Elsie argued that although women had earned more rights, they kept turning back to their appearance and seeking approval from their man. Elsie continued, 
The big idea in the average female's life today is exactly what it was a hundred, a thousand, and a hundred thousand years ago. It is a man. Her one objective is getting that man. Her one big fear is losing him. Elsie encouraged her readers to find their worth in things other than men. She used her columns to spread feminist ideas, something relatively new for her time. Though the women's rights movement started years earlier and the feminist movement was still to come, Elsie played an important role in earning equality. Alison Gilbert, the co-author of Elsie Robinson's biography, writes, Nearly 50 years before Betty Friedan first mentioned the problem that has no name, Elsie Robinson gave a voice to a generation of women who had none. Elsie provided the type of voice that inspired Betty Friedan. Robinson and Friedan both were discontent with their situations, so both wrote about it and were met with a support that trailblazed frontiers. Even by today's standards, Elsie was incredibly influential. The total number of current New York Times subscribers is just over 9 million people, meaning Elsie had more than double the readers of one of the most prominent modern American papers. Elsie pushed against people who wanted to silence her, often writing angry letters to her bosses demanding equal pay. She repeatedly challenged the views of others on issues such as racism, writing in her columns, and on what, may I ask, do you base your supremacy? You could have put aside ignorance, prejudice, and contemptible snootiness and given your lives for unity, but you weren't big enough. You weren't brave enough. With a wide influence, Elsie faced criticism as well. Even other columnists made light of her. One man wrote an opinionated article then told readers who didn't agree with him to go cry on Geraldine's shoulder elsewhere in the paper. He was making fun of the column in general, something Elsie faced frequently. Elsie kept her promise to publish any hate mail she received, showing her tenacity in that she wasn't afraid of what others thought of her writing or opinions. Her logical arguments and bold words attracted enough people to make her America's most read woman, publishing over 9,000 columns in 40 years. Through her revolutionary writing, Elsie brought about significant change. Elsie was the first female columnist to write about her views on social norms. She was also the first columnist to write her stories and draw her cartoons, something still rare today. In 1940, a woman wrote a column about Elsie with an autographed letter from Elsie herself. The author writes, This woman, who has helped through her writings to ease the heartaches of others, found that in helping others, she was finding herself. While finding herself, Elsie managed to change the lives of over 20 million others, making her an important pioneer. Elsie Robinson overcame many obstacles in her life and encouraged others, especially women, to overcome their trials and advocate for social equality. Elsie's national influence is inspirational because she rose from adversity, and to all willing to search it out, she is remembered as a notable pioneer who pushed the frontiers of women in the workplace and equal rights. Through her writing, she continues to encourage others to live up to their full potential, overcome their troubles, and engage in the struggle for justice and equity, starting with you and me. Elena, thank you so much for your very well put document put together documentary and very thought provoking documentary. I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to start off by asking how you ended up picking Elsie Robinson as the topic for your data for your documentary. Yeah, so um, I think from the beginning, I knew I wanted to do a topic on women's history. So I was browsing the National Women's History Museum website looking for topics. And then um, there's a page that has images of female pioneers and then their name. And if you hover over their name, it gives you like a little preview. And then if you click on it, it gives you like a little short biography. So I was just sort of clicking through at random and I clicked on Elsie Robinson's name and I read the biography and I was like, wow, this connects to this year's theme so well. And I showed my teacher and he was like, yeah, I think that'd be a great topic. So, yeah. One of the things that I think, Elsie Robinson is only a name I had read uh, in passing and was really thrilled to understand a lot more about her through your documentary. Um, which of her formats, if it was uh, uh, Geraldine or if it was Aunt Elsie's Club, which, is, which one did you find uh, spoke to you the most? Um. I think Listen World spoke to me the most, um, just because that was her main platform where she was pushing so many of these new ideas. But there was also um, a format that I saw that I didn't read very much into, but it was called Young America Speaks. And um, 
I haven't looked too much into it because it didn't wasn't really part of like my main research but it was basically like teenagers writing in and I thought that was really cool so listen world and young America speaks uh, one of the things I found absolutely fascinating about uh, Elsie Robinson was that she published her hate mail. Um, what was that like reading that uh, for you doing this research? Um, it was definitely new to me because um, I knew she had like received hate mail and I knew that she had written about receiving it, but I think it was very bold of her to publish that so I think it just kind of reinforced that she was a pioneer and she wasn't afraid or maybe she was afraid but she was very courageous is there anything that surprised you when you were doing your research uh into how successful Elsie became yeah so um, when I first started researching, I like didn't realize how, how much of an influence she had. Um, she had over 20 million readers nationally. And that might just sound like I'm throwing out a number. But if you think about it, um, there are about 20 million teenagers in the U.S. today. So if every single teenager in the United States started like reading and listening to one person, that would be like the influence she had. When you look at the topics that she courageously took on, whether it was sexism, anti-Semitism, or racism, which of those or uh, what topics that she took, did you see her develop a true voice that became nationally recognized? Um. I think from the articles I read, she definitely focused more on sexism and racism. And I think um, the sexism part of it was what um, she's known for today. And I think that's what she had the most national influence in. Do you believe that she's recognized enough for the role that she played in bringing forward the very difficult conversation of overt sexism and the birth of the feminist movement? I don't think she gets enough recognition um, or recognition or whatever, <laughs> whatever the word is. Um, I don't think she gets enough credit for what she did because she was so well known. She was such a big household, na household name and um, not even 70 years later, she's been completely forgotten. Like I, I had never heard of her and, um, no one at my school had ever heard of her. And whenever I would play my documentary to people, they would always be so surprised. And I think it's crazy that someone with such a wide influence could be forgotten. And it almost makes me think of what other people have been forgotten. Do you have a, a favorite piece of hers that she wrote or that was written into her? Um, I liked a lot of her editorial cartoons. And one of them was, uh, so it was a Listen World, and I think it was one of her earlier ones, where she was talking about, um, like, almost laziness. And if we're going to be, like, proactive or if we're going to be reactive. And the cartoon was just, like, a person sitting on a couch just like sleeping away and the caption was are you a go-getter or a gob of slime which I think it definitely grabbed my attention and it was a very interesting way of putting it so that was just one of my favorites that came to mind. One of the things I, I found absolutely fascinating was the implicit discussion of um, inflation and how much uh, she made uh, and how much that would be in, in real dollars. Um, but outside of the, the, the salaries that she made, where do you think her largest impact was in communicating these ideas? Um, so 
I know I've been kind of saying this a lot, but I mean, she had 20 million readers and people wouldn't have kept reading if they wouldn't, if they didn't um, almost respond or have a reaction to what they were reading. And her public publishers wouldn't have let her keep writing. They wouldn't have paid her so much if she wasn't getting so many reactions. So I think in anything that she wrote, whether it was about racism or anti-Semitism or sexism or even just laziness, people were listening to her. So I don't think it's possible to pick out just one thing that she had an impact on because she wrote almost 4,000 pieces and they were all listened to. Yeah, uh, Elena, thank you so much uh, for your time today and your wonderful documentary about a truly amazing person in Elsie Robinson. Thank you and uh, congratulations on your award. Thank you so much. Next is third place winner in the senior division of the National History Day competition, Indian Magna Carta, the proclamation of 1763 and the indigenous people's rights frontier directed by Yelena Rose Armsworth, ninth grade student at l and STEM Academy in Knoxville, Tennessee. The aftermath of the Seven Years' War caused racially driven conflict in the colonies as Native Americans resisted British occupation. This hostility forced Britain to pass the Royal Proclamation of 1763, a document that ended up changing the course of indigenous rights in North America forever. In February of 1763, the Treaty of Paris ended the Seven Years' War and ushered in a massive shift in power, as it granted all land east of the Mississippi River to Great Britain. But the treaty ignored the indigenous peoples of North America. Now that they were under British control and colonists were already trickling westward to access the new farmland and resources available, the indigenous people feared for their sovereignty. In Pontiac's rebellion, a dozen native tribes banded together and attacked colonial communities near the Great Lakes to try to protect their sovereignty. As indigenous people stood up for their rights, colonists also grew violent. In 1763, the Paxton boys murdered a group of Native Americans as they prayed near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. On October 7th, King George III passed the Royal Proclamation of 1763 in the hopes it would help end the racial conflict. Britain did not want to have to pay to send British troops to keep peace in the colonies. The document set a boundary line, known as the Proclamation Line of 1763, to divide the colonies from the western frontier along the Eastern Continental Divide and the Appalachian Mountains. The western frontier was reserved for Native Americans. The proclamation stated that indigenous peoples could not be harassed or exploited by colonists, and only the government could purchase land. The proclamation also said that, because of the frauds that individuals committed when purchasing indigenous land, from then forward, only the British government could purchase land from indigenous peoples to maintain positive relationships in peace. The beginning, there was a promise that the Crown would, would support and protect uh, indigenous nations from the behavior of colonial governments. Since the government was making treaties to purchase land from the indigenous peoples, they were considered landowners and their rights were recognized as such. Although indigenous peoples still had restricted rights, it was a step in the right direction. They were sovereign and protected under law. The U.S. disregarded these rules as they moved towards independence, but they remained relevant in Canada. By setting a legal framework where indigenous people were considered landowners, the proclamation set a precedent for future treaty making and expanded the figurative indigenous people's rights frontier. For some indigenous people, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is so momentous that it is called the Indian Magna Carta. Its proponents argue that it was as fundamental for the indigenous people's rights frontier as the Magna Carta was for the foundation of constitutional governments. Back in the colonies, when the proclamation was first issued, it irritated colonists by posing a legal challenge for acquiring land in the West. The proclamation allowed for some new settlement by creating the territories of Quebec, West and East Florida, and Grenada. However, it forbade settlement in the Western frontier. The Ohio River Valley was designated for Native Americans, and colonists would no longer be allowed to move westward. Those already in the West were supposed to move back. 
One British leader, when asked to grant land patents, said, I do not mean to grant any patents on the western waters, as I do not think I am at present empowered to do so. The wording of the Royal Proclamation of 1763 meant that all the land in the western frontier belonged to the Native Americans. Previously, wealthy gentry had invested in land-based companies, which bought land in the west and resold it at a higher price. But they could no longer get the titles they needed. Individuals were also forbidden from purchasing land from the Native Americans. In the Transylvania Purchase, for example, an individual tried to purchase Cherokee land, but his ownership was not recognized by the British government. The Royal Proclamation was viewed as restrictive and invasive. Britain was interfering in colonial affairs from across the sea. The proclamation prevented economic opportunities for the wealthy, since they could no longer invest in land-based companies, and it benefited Britain's mercantile economy, irritating colonists. Beyond frustrating colonists, the proclamation was not taken seriously. Colonists felt justified in moving westward because they had fought in the Seven Years' War, winning the land for Britain. They felt that the proclamation was merely passed to appease Native peoples. Echoing the belief of many, George Washington said that he considered the proclamation a temporary expedient to pacify the Native Americans, and that he felt individuals should go ahead and claim land in the western frontier before the opportunity elapsed. For instance, Daniel Boone, shown here, cut the Cumberland Gap in 1775, which was a violation of the proclamation. When the U.S. declared independence from Great Britain, they got rid of the line entirely to allow for westward expansion. However, later U.S. legislation was influenced by the Royal Proclamation. In the Supreme Court case Johnson v. McIntosh in 1823, for example, the Supreme Court reinforced the policy that only the government, although this time the United States government, would be allowed to purchase land from the Native Americans, and that individual land purchases would not be recognized. Along with Worcester v. Georgia and Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, the cases make up the Marshall Trilogy and the foundation of Native American land rights and tribal sovereignty within the U.S. While these are critical components of modern cases and campaigns, it is important to note that the United States' history of following its own decisions is very flawed. The Indian Removal Act of 1830 blatantly disregarded the verdicts of the Marshall Trilogy beginning the Trail of Tears. Unlike the U.S., the proclamation has a resounding legal influence in Canada, which remained a part of the British Empire. In 1764, a meeting between Britain and a few dozen indigenous troops was held at Niagara. British officials explained the proclamation to tribal leaders, and treaties and agreements were made. Wampum belts, like the one shown here, were exchanged, symbolizing the treaties. This set a peaceful precedent for treaty making in the future. After the Revolutionary War, Britain made treaties with the Ojibwe and Ashinaabe peoples near the Great Lakes to gain territory to give to incoming settlers. In return, they reserved lands nearby for the indigenous people in Canada. Today, the Proclamation of 1763 is enshrined in Section 25 of the Constitution Act in Canada. The document says that rights and freedoms recognized by the Royal Proclamation of October 7, 1763 are still recognized today. Essentially, Canadian law says that, per the Royal Proclamation of 1763, Indigenous peoples' rights cannot be restricted. It's very important to recognize that over 250 years, the Royal Proclamation has been that golden thread that ties all the foundational documents that represent this idea of Canada together and create an ongoing responsibility to recognize the spirit and intent of the original relationship. The proclamation's 250th anniversary was celebrated with meetings in London and Ottawa in 2013. But for others, the proclamation's anniversary simply served as a reminder of the government's broken promises and the historical and ongoing challenges faced by Indigenous peoples. Events such as Canada's residential school system and other colonial oppressions have led to ongoing socioeconomic issues for Indigenous peoples. That we will defend our land, our water, our bodies, our stories, our collective future, which is rooted in this sacred re responsibility of sovereignty and self-determination. Many Indigenous people gathered in protest on October 7, 2013, in Canada to raise awareness. They urged the government to protect Indigenous land, water, and resources from pollution and destruction, as was promised by the proclamation. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 began as a physical frontier, the Proclamation Line, which separated the colonists from the lands reserved for Indigenous peoples in the West. 
By forbidding colonists from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains, the British hoped to reduce conflict with the Native Americans and secure future peace. At the time it was issued, it irritated colonists and helped spark the frustration that led to the American Revolution. While the line was not enforced or respected, the ideals of the proclamation live on. It marked the first time indigenous peoples were recognized as sovereign and landowners, so it set a precedent for treaty making and redefined indigenous crown relationships, since indigenous people were considered political entities. The wording of the proclamation influenced American court cases and legislation protecting Native Americans. In Canada, the proclamation is considered a foundational constitutional document and it provides the legal framework for indigenous people's rights. The spirit of the proclamation wasn't always upheld as both countries' histories of oppression demonstrate, but it provides the legal support for ongoing indigenous rights movements. The Indian Magna Carta is the foundation of the indigenous people's rights frontier and it set the stage for their rights and treatment today. Although it was issued over 250 years ago in a different era, the proclamation remains relevant. Ongoing campaigns and court cases in both countries echo back to the principles of the proclamation, that indigenous people could live under their own governance, on their own land, and would be protected. Fight for the rights, for the rights of our people. Fight for the rights, for the rights of our people. For our people, for our future people. Thank you for your documentary, Yelena Rose. Um, I wanted to, uh, there's been a, a through story in, in this film festival about indigenous rights. And I think one of the things I like that I think was the was really well done in yours is the story from where it started and all of the knock on effects from that. And so I wanted to ask how you settled on the proclamation of six of 1763 as a topic for this year's documentary. Yeah, so when I was starting research at the beginning of last year, I was looking at like the founding of Tennessee as a state as a frontier. And so I was sort of, you know, researching local history. And I, you know, found the proclamation line of 1763. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was a frontier for, you know, the founding of the United States. And so it was actually like almost a month later, you know, I was still researching and reading articles and stuff when I found out that it was really important in Canada and across the world for indigenous rights. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. And I participate in Model UN. So I'm, you know, interested in topics that have international impact and, you know, how things in the past affect what happens today. And so I thought it was a really cool topic and I wanted to learn more about it. What surprised you the most when you were doing the, the research into how this was not only the frontier of the United States as it was happening, the frontier of human and indigenous rights, and a frontier in intergovernmental uh, cooperation. So I was, of course, surprised that the document was still so influential in Canada. And because that's not really something we learn about here in the U.S. at all. But of course, you know, it's really important. And like the Canadian government had whole pages on their websites about it. And so it was surprising to me that a document that was, you know, important in both countries, but really significant still in Canada was just you know, like completely glossed over in our history books when, you know, it's still really important today. What was one of the most fascinating things that you thought about from a visual standpoint in how you were constructing uh, your documentary? So from a visual standpoint, you know, it was hard to find primary sources from you know, 1763, there obviously aren't a lot of, you know, documents left over, but I was really struck by, like, there was a photo of the proclamation that was, you know, a copy preserved in a library in the UK, I think, and that was a very striking visual, and I actually found it on a news article that was talking about the proclamation's 250th anniversary, so this image of the proclamation was side by side with a photograph of a Canadian delegation for this proclamation anniversary celebration. So, you know, like indigenous leaders, you know, gathering and it was, you know, side by side. And I found that very striking. So, yeah. 
it's it's not often that I'm reminded of my own time in high school learning about the Marshall trilogy. Um, how was it reading uh, <laughs> Supreme Court decisions from <laughs> from that long ago? It was a bit rough at times. Um, sometimes when I was annotating documents, I would have to like completely print them out and you know mark them down with highlighter just to figure out exactly what the wording meant and what was going on. But I thought it was really cool that stuff that happened so long ago was still so important today for, you know, ongoing legislation. When you think about the effect of the 1763 proclamation in, in the westward expansion of the United States and in the cause of the American Revolution, what lessons do you think there are to learn about uh, the founding of the United States in uh, in the existence of this document. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that at you know at the time all of this stuff was happening, indigenous rights was an issue, and then it kind of got just you know stomped all over, and you know indigenous rights weren't protected, and there you know these documents are coming back up now, and you know we're reminded of the promises that our government made all that time ago and that they didn't respect um, when, you know, addressing indigenous concerns and, you know, land claims and stuff. And I think it's important to acknowledge the history, um, history, like the promises we made and the promises we didn't keep um, so that we can move forward and not make those mistakes again in the future um, and try to do better at, you know, building connections with indigenous communities and respecting their concerns when passing legislation. One of the things I really enjoyed about your documentary was the use of your use of various uh, pieces of music that matched really well with the visuals that you were presenting. How was that process for you and how did you decide what to use? Yeah, so I really enjoyed picking the music for my documentary. It was probably my favorite part. I'm a band kid, so, you know, I love listening to music. And so I spent hours, you know, you know listening to various albums and trying to figure out what I liked best and what I thought would work and one of my songs I believe it's Fight for the Rights by Kelly Frazier you know she's a indigenous indigenous Canadian artist and so I thought it was really impactful I really enjoyed the song and I thought it fit well with the theme of my documentary so I chose to include that one one of the things I think you did very deftly was you are talking about a document from 1763 and so you had a lot of still images with text over it and then you brought that into uh the the modern uh era by using uh, were they skype interviews with uh with individuals that you were talking with so a lot of the video footage in my documentary they're actually youtube clips so in 2013 when the proclamation's 250th anniversary was going on like a lot of news sources were doing interviews on that um, I was not, you know, researching in 2013, so I didn't really have that opportunity. Um, I did reach out to some uh, Canadian scholars, but there wasn't really an opportunity for an interview in person or over a Zoom call with them. So the ones in the documentary are recordings. So, however, like, I'm still impressed with how you went from vellum documents into modern uh in, into modern days was that always the intention to make that through line to emphasize your point yeah i thought it was super cool that a document from so long ago was still important and still talked about and i wanted to really highlight that to people because i don't feel like it was talked about in the u.s enough and when i showed my documentary to people you know most people didn't know that the proclamation was still so important they only thought of it as something that had happened a long time ago for, you know, the American Revolution and not something that was still important and impactful and talked about in Canada and in indigenous communities across the world. Well, Yelena Rose, I want to thank you so very much for your documentary. Uh, I learned an incredible amount uh, from it and uh, congratulations on your award. Thank you very much. Next is second place winner in the senior division of the National History Day competition, Glen Canyon. Frontiers open, paradise flooded.
directed by Shay McGrath, formerly a 12th grade student at Francis Parker School in San Diego, California, and currently a freshman at Bowdoin College in Maine. Glen Canyon isn't a stereotypical frontier of the American West. Rather, it represents three distinct frontiers emblematic of the changing cultural landscape of the mid-20th century. First, Glen Canyon Dam pioneered new engineering, technology, and science in furthering our exploration into the frontier of water management in a desert climate. Second, the flooding of Glen Canyon behind the dam catalyzed the birth of a new radical environmentalist movement from which new frontiers of environmental thought and protest both emerged. And finally, Glen Canyon represents an unknown frontier, the future and how we manage water in a drastically changing climate where drought is the norm. Glen Canyon is about 200 miles of the Colorado River in the Four Corners region. John Wesley Powell is said to be the first explorer of Glen Canyon in 1869, but Jack Stouse of the Glen Canyon Institute explains how indigenous communities have lived in the area for thousands of years. So people lived there, even when they built the dam, including the Navajo and the Paiute. Um, but it's the historical homeland of several tribes in the basin. Long before Spanish conquistadors crossed the landscape, before trappers followed the rivers and streams, long before pioneering settlements dotted this region, before anyone else would try to write their history, five principal nations of indigenous people called the Great Basin their homeland. However, the United States continued to expand into the Southwest during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. More people began flocking to desert states. As population soared, so did the demand for water. The only solution was the region's largest river, the Colorado. To manage its water, the Colorado River Compact was signed in 1922, dividing the river's annual flow between the seven basin states and Mexico. Unfortunately, indigenous voices were excluded from conversations and written out of water policy itself pertaining to a river that they had relied on for thousands of years. The Colorado River Compact did lay the foundation for the construction of dams such as Glen Canyon Dam. So the Glen Canyon Dam was proposed um, as part of the Colorado River Storage Act in the 1950s. Um, it's approved as part of a multi-dam package. Construction for Glen Canyon Dam began in 1960 and it was dedicated in 1966 by Lady Bird Johnson. And our country is entering a new era of wise water conservation. I am proud to dedicate such a significant and beautiful man-made resource. I am proud that man is here. The hardcore water and power benefits of this dam are well known. Just like Hoover Dam, Glen Canyon Dam is a marvel of 20th century engineering. Setting a new precedent for water storage, Glen Canyon Dam in Lake Powell can hold up to 12 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. Glen Canyon Dam also opened a new frontier in hydroelectric power generation. The dam is the second largest producer of hydroelectric power in the country and sends its power across much of the southwest. The creation of Lake Powell behind Glen Canyon Dam also proved that recreation could be paired with water management. The town of Page, Arizona owes all of its economic livelihood to the dam. Page wasn't here prior to Glen Canyon Dam. There was nothing here. You couldn't get here from there, so to speak. While Glen Canyon Dam introduced new tourism to southern Utah and broke ground into new techniques of water management, it also closed a frontier that had always defined the American Southwest. The wild Colorado River was finally tamed, and this sparked the creation of a new environmental movement expanding into a new frontier of activism, protest, and literature. Here's Jack Stouse of the Glen Canyon Institute on how the dam opened a new chapter in the history of American environmentalism. Um, I kind of talk about the Glen Canyon Dam um, construction as sort of the beginning of the modern era of American environmentalism. So it definitely catalyzed people like Edward Abbey, Katie Lee, Harry Tempest Williams, David Brower um, to really take a more hardline approach to advocating for wild space and rivers. In one of the most gorgeous canyons on the planet, 
and these idiots drowned it. It had 125 side canyons, every one of them a total jewel. But this paradise was doomed to be flooded under the stagnant water of Lake Powell. Newly energized by witnessing such a beautiful place being flooded forever, environmentalists such as Edward Abbey spoke out against the dam. I was one of the lucky few who did get to see the canyon before it was submerged. Although I'm not sure I was lucky, it's a bittersweet memory. Here's Abbey again on top of Glen Canyon Dam. After 10 years of modest environmental progress, the powers of industrialism and militarism have become alarmed. The empire is striking back, so we must continue to strike back at the empire by whatever means available to us. And one of those means was song, as exhibited by Katie Lee. And the fourth one was the Wreck the Nation Bureau song, because, you know, I truly have a abiding hatred of that organization and everybody in it. So I wrote the Wreck the Nation Bureau. Three cheers for the Wreck the Nation Bureau. Freeloaders with soul so puro, wiped out the good Lord's work in six short years, may they all rot in hell. Never before had environmentalists rallied around a place and used such a diverse variety of tactics. Music, speeches, protests, and more were just a few of the ways in which people spoke out against Glen Canyon Dam. Finally, Glen Canyon Dam represents an unknown frontier of climate change and drought amidst the changing southwest. As of February 2023, Lake Powell is only 22% full. With Lake Powell and Lake Mead never expected to completely refill to their original levels, the future of 20th century dams in a changing climate of today is uncertain. In the face of severe drought, organizations such as the Glen Canyon Institute are raising questions about the role of the dam. Um, I think we made a huge mistake by, by filling the dam. I don't think it was needed. And we're seeing now that it wasn't needed. We have enough capacity in Lake Mead alone to hold water for the water. Unlike Lake Mead, Lake Powell has no direct role in storing drinking water for the basin. They needed storage reservoirs in the upper basin so they could store water as it's available in upper basin states. Users are not using it so it can be stored again. In other words, Lake Powell was constructed to be a storage facility rather than an active supply of drinking water. You know, nobody actually draws water out of Lake Powell, which is the holy tank for the upper basin to deliver their illegal allotment down to me to not a drop more. Considering Lake Powell's role and the impact of drought, environmental groups such as the Glen Canyon Institute call on the government today to drain Lake Powell in favor of filling Lake Mead first. Glen Canyon Dam's future is uncertain, but one thing is for sure. As water levels recede, Glen Canyon itself is recovering in ecological and in cultural ways. Severe drought that has brought the second biggest reservoir in the U.S. down to its lowest level ever is also now revealing lost treasures. Thousands of archaeological sites that were flooded when Lake Powell was filled in the 1960s. The Colorado River is more depleted and overstressed every day, as acknowledged by Commissioner Camille Tootin of the Bureau of Reclamation. There's so much to this that is unprecedented, and that is true. But unprecedented is now the reality and a normal in which reclamation must manage our systems. A warmer, drier west is what we are seeing today. However, creating an equitable approach to managing the Colorado in drought is not possible without listening to the needs of indigenous communities who rely on the river. Tribes have senior water rights to at least 25% of the current natural flow of the Colorado River and have historically been excluded from decision making or consulted only after decisions have been made. The federal government's recent water policy changes in May 2023 cuts water allocations from states to protect the river, but this time includes indigenous needs. President Biden states the recent agreement is, quote, a critical step to building a sustainable, resilient future for states, tribes, and communities throughout the West. Glen Canyon is central to the national discussion of how we cope with drought in a changing climate today because it teaches us that water, culture, ecology, and economics must all be considered in planning for an even drier future. While Glen Canyon is just one place, it represents three frontiers, the history of water development, a new environmental movement, and finally, the future of water in the desert southwest. Even with an uncertain future, Glen Canyon is a frontier that reminds us of the importance of nature. Speaking in protest from Glen Canyon Dam in 1982, Edward Abbey has a final word. 
climb those mountains, run those rivers, hike those canyons, explore those forests, and share in the beauty of wilderness, friendship, love. Thank you for joining us, Shay, and congratulations on your achievement. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable. Um, I want to thank you for your documentary on Glen Canyon, and um, I wanted to start off by asking what inspired you to choose this topic for this year's History Day theme? When I first set out to brainstorm some ideas, I initially reflected on a few books I've read recently. And in the past couple of summers, I've been really interested in environmentalist reading and reading about the history of the um, second half of the 20th century and, and how the environmentalist movement really came into light. And after reading several books, um, one called Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner, um, one called Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey and a bunch of other uh, of Abbey's works um, and a few Stegner um, books here and there too, it really, um, you know, turn on a light within my head. And, and as someone who grew up in San Diego, I was thinking, geez, there's just so much, um, there's so many factors at play here in shaping how we view the resources um, that we surround ourselves with in the desert. And um, it's such a unique region of the country. And um, the theme of History Day, Frontiers in History this year, uh, just felt really, really appropriate for the challenges that we see in the American Southwest. So that's, um, I'm glad you brought up the the, the word frontiers as, as that was the theme but one of the things that I find truly remarkable about your documentary is how you weaved in not only the technological frontier of building dams uh, of the future of water management and resources and environmentalism and I was that something that came up naturally or was it something where you started with one and then you started you, so you started with environmentalism and moved on to the others or how did how did you decide to bring those three together so i started the the research process and how i was introduced to the topic was mostly from the environmentalist angle um which was a pretty unique um direction to come into that topic from because it's it's very anti dam it's very anti um, bureaucracy it's very anti development um, but then I started listening to uh, some of the other sources that were out there. And as soon as you dive beneath the surface of this topic, especially, um, or pretty much any other topic pertaining to water in the Southwest, you'll find that there are just, there's a, just a multitude of voices um, from all different angles about, you know, who, who controls the water, who uses the water, how it's developed. And water has always been contentious in the, in the desert Southwest. Um, so yeah, coming from it, uh, coming at the topic from the environmentalist standpoint first was definitely unique. But as soon as I started digging in more um, and forming my project, I just knew that I had to um, uh, focus on those other two, uh, you know, angles too, like the the benefits of the dam and also the um, the future, because you can't just approach the dam or Glen Canyon or water in the West um, from a single sided approach. It's it's too it's too big of a topic um, to approach from one dimension. So it sounds like what you're saying is that might have been the most surprising thing that you learned by coming out of this research. Um, when you started to look at it holistically, how did that affect how you wanted to put together the documentary? So how did that affect your narrative through through 10 minutes? One of the first things that I wanted to do as soon as I discovered the, the three pretty distinct um, subtopics, as, as I might, you know, as I call them during the project, um, was I wanted to have them distinctly visual on the screen. I'm a very visual person. I love being able to see, you know, different categories and things. When I write essays, I'll, you know, block out the different topics. Um, and I did that on a piece of paper with the three different topics, just like a, a five paragraph essay. And then I started thinking, I can be pretty creative with this um, and using video editing uh, to put, you know, each of the three distinct um, themes of the project on their own little window and zooming in and out to kind of create a narrative. You know, OK, here we go, diving into this part of the story, zooming back out. Now we're going to dive into the future of, of Glen Canyon, dive back out. Um, so it was a really, uh, you know, it. it using Premiere and using the editing process really allowed me to express my creativity and also um, develop a pretty distinct approach to, um, you know, separating my thesis into those three uh, sections. One of the, the through lines, I think, of many of the documentaries that uh, we've seen tonight uh, is about the rights of Indigenous peoples in the places where they are. 
Um, can you talk about the importance of recent developments with land land water usage and the inclusion of indigenous voices? That is one of, one of the biggest pieces of this topic, and it's um, and it's impossible to to mention water in the in the southwest without mentioning indigenous voices, like you said, and. Um, one of the most uh, surprising and in a good way surprising things that I've learned um, is just reading the news over the past few years and seeing how, you know, th there's all these battles going on in court, out of court, um, in communities throughout the Southwest um, between Indigenous communities who have been using the Colorado River and its tributaries for tens of thousands of years. And um, seeing some of the recent policy changes too, um, I, I mentioned one of them at the end of, uh, of my documentary um, and, and how, how the government's starting to, to write Native American communities back into water policy that they've been excluded from for centuries um, was really moving. And it really, it really showed that we are moving in the right direction um, as, a, as a nation interacting with sovereign tribal nations, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And you know, still reading the news about the Colorado River today, you'll still see so much inequity and so much um, inequality in how uh, Indigenous communities are still being left out on the table. But hearing the congressional testimony um, was actually very moving to hear. Um, and the full thing, I wish I could have played it in the documentary, but it was really moving to hear how water rights um, are just inherently racist and inherently exclusionary. So I think one of the one of the things that struck stuck me struck me is how well this was put together with the three distinct storylines. Is there anything that you were disappointed that you couldn't include in 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 because of the time limits? But like how? And I'm sorry for sort of mincing my words here. But was there anything that you had to cut that you were disappointed that you had to cut out? Yes, one of the um, like I mentioned, the there was a congressional testimony. I found a lot of uh, amazing sources on C-SPAN and the government library. And um, one of the sources that I had to cut, unfortunately, was a, a testimony from a tribal leader um, from northern Arizona. And his testimony was basically describing to, to the Congress people, this is the history of water policy and how it relates to my community. And this is the future. And the history is looking way too similar to the future. Um, and that testimony really inspired some change within um, how those politicians viewed um, water policies, uh, especially in the Colorado River Basin. And that testimony, I mean, I sat down and watched the full half an hour because it was just, um, I couldn't stop watching it. It was really fascinating and it was really moving too. And it, it really revealed a lot about um, how, how difficult water management is. So if I had more time in the documentary, I totally would have expended more on that subject because um, his testimony was just fascinating. Well, Shay, thank you so very much for, again, a very powerful uh, and really amazingly put together documentary. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. Next is first place winner in the senior division of the National History Day competition, Wade in the Water, How African Americans Got Back into the Pool, directed by Abigail Giroux, 10th grade student at the Bryn Mawr School in Baltimore, Maryland. By the mid 1800s, populous cities in the American Northeast feared diseases like cholera. To prevent outbreaks thought to originate with deadly odors, cities opened communal baths some built directly into rivers. These public pools were open to everyone, regardless of ethnicity or race. But as the nation embraced recreational swimming in the early 1900s, African Americans found themselves pushed out of the water from coast to coast as the best pools and beaches became whites-only spaces. This is the story of how African Americans conquered the frontier of recreational swimming to get back into the pool. As northern cities built their first pools, the South was recovering from the Civil War. African Americans expected social transformation but remained trapped in poverty by a new and repressive system denying them equal treatment. Jim Crow Seeking opportunity, roughly two million African Americans moved north and west between 1910 and 1940. 
They had come looking for opportunity, but African Americans were confined to poor quality housing and low status work as laborers or domestic servants. They were attacked by working class whites who saw them as competition. Racial conflict spiraled into mass events of white on black violence with the summer of 1919, so bloody it was called Red Summer. Chicago's Red Summer Riot began on July 27th when a teenager was stoned and drowned after entering the white section of the 29th Street Beach. White on black violence convulsed the city for days. By the time state guardsmen regained control of the city, almost 40 people had been killed, 500 more were injured, and thousands were left homeless. Northern attitudes towards African Americans now resembled those in the South. Increasingly, recreational swimming amenities were reserved for whites. Even in the North, African Americans swam on the margins. In the 1920s, cities built large, resort-like pools to serve as recreation for the entire family. But as white swimming surged, discriminatory laws and the threat of violence curtailed African Americans' access to swimming amenities. The 1929 stock market crash ended the Roaring Twenties. But as the federal government put the unemployed to work on infrastructure projects, spending on parks, pools, and beaches soared. From 1933 to 1938, the government built roughly 750 pools and renovated many more. A small fraction of pool building benefited African Americans, who were paying taxes for expensive improvements they could not use. But with most New Deal era beaches, lakes, rivers, and pools considered white space, African Americans were locked out of swimming from sea to shining sea. African American children with no swimming access cooled off in canals and ornamental fountains during hot summers. Jim Crow laws and the threat of violence kept them out of the pool. A separate but unequal investment in swimming instruction meant African American children drowned at higher rates than white peers. Swimming exclusion was not just unfair, it was unsafe. During the Second World War, African Americans linked segregation and lynching with Hitler's ideology. African Americans pushed for pool integration, but whites responded violently. In June of 1949, St. Louis, Missouri desegregated city pools, including Fairgrounds Pool. African American swimmers were attacked by a mob of armed whites that swelled to thousands. The pool closed. Court victories were breaking segregation down, but African Americans remained outside the pool, looking in. In 1954, the NAACP took two cases to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Lonesome v. Maxwell showed the risks of segregated swimming. Buddy Lonesome, an African American child, drowned while swimming with an interracial friend group in the Patapsco River, the only place they could swim together. The judge reversed earlier rulings. The nation's public pools would reintegrate at last. Previously, Baltimore City offered six large outdoor pools for whites, but one small pool in Drew Hill Park for African Americans who swam in shifts. On June 23, 1956, Baltimore's public pools integrated. In the first year they integrated the pools, I was at the number one pool where we couldn't swim all our lives. I was the, the first black female uh, lifeguard that they had in 1956. That's the year they integrated the, the pools. Even as a lifeguard, uh, I know that a lot of the white people didn't come anymore. As African Americans waded into public waters, white Americans retreated. From 1950 to 1999, the number of private pools increased from 2,500 to 4 million. Private swimming excluded African Americans and others deemed socially inferior. Youth swim lessons went private too. In the 1950s, new leaders like Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. explained to white Americans what life was like under segregation and why it should end. I could not use uh, the swimming pool. So that, uh, for a long, long time, I could not go in swimming until uh, the YMCA was built. Negro YMCA, and they had a swimming pool there. But certainly, a Negro child in Atlanta could not go to any public park. 
A lunch counter sit-in at a segregated Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, in February of 1960, proved the value of nonviolent direct action. Activists nationally were sitting in, standing in, and kneeling in, but they were also swimming in and wading in at pools and beaches. In 1964, King and other members of the Southern Christian Leadership Congress traveled to St. Augustine, Florida to support the civil rights campaign being waged there. King would call St. Augustine the most lawless community he had encountered. King first tried to integrate the Monsaw Motor Lodge's whites-only dining room in St. Augustine. King was arrested. From jail, he called for support from American rabbis. A week later, protesters led a swim in at the lodge pool while rabbis prayed. Incensed, the lodge manager poured acid into the pool. He also attacked the rabbis. The swimmers and rabbis were arrested. Days later, civil rights protesters waiting in at St. Augustine's whites-only beach were confronted by segregationists holding sticks. The events in St. Augustine made the papers nationally. The following week, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law on July 2, 1964, by President Lyndon Johnson, who specifically mentioned the events of St. Augustine as a motivating factor. White retreat from public swimming left large cities swimming deprived. Summer heat made inner-city life intolerable, sparking urban riots. July 12, 1966, teenagers opened a hydrant on Chicago's west side, police closed it, and a crowd gathered. Rumors of police brutality and mass hydrant closures triggered a three-day riot. In response, the federal government funded a new wave of urban pool building. These pools weren't resort-like. The 1960s pools were small and often lacked basic amenities, like changing rooms. Investment in public swimming was short-lived. Of the 70 pools opened in New York City between 1966 and 1971, all but 23 had closed by 1994. The luxurious public pools of the 1920s had come to an inglorious end. Depleted investment in publicly funded swimming and swimming instruction became the twin legacies of segregated swimming. The tragic result was consistently higher rates of drowning for African Americans. After a lifetime of teaching physical education, Miss Scott worries about access to recreational sports. Baltimore City as such needs more recreational facilities. The ones that were there, so many of them are gone, and there are no, there's no place for the kids to play and learn sports. Recognizing the risk of unequal access to swimming, the nation is reconsidering swimming access and education. Public pools closed in the 1980s and 1990s are reopening to serve communities. Jim Crow era African American pools and beaches are recognized as historic sites with educational and social value. And elite African American competitive swimmers demonstrate for a new generation that everyone belongs in the water. Abigail, thank you for a very powerful and moving documentary. I want to say congratulations on how well it was put together and the message that was uh, inside it. Um, I wanted to start off by asking how you came to this topic um, and how that informed what your message was going to be. I first came across this topic when I had actually applied to volunteer at the Maryland Zoo, which is in Drude Hill Park. And in Drude Hill Park, there's a number one pool and there's a number two pool. And I had actually had the chance of seeing the number two pool at my time volunteering at the Maryland Zoo, which had been turned into an art exhibit. And after seeing this art exhibit, I kind of became very interested in understanding more about the history of these pools. And so it started off as just doing a little bit of research online, starting to read a couple of articles, and that, that led to me reading a couple of books on the subject. And I actually came to learn that there was a very deep-rooted history of exclusion and segregation attached to the number two pool that I was seeing in Druid Hill Park, and also many other pools and different recreational spaces around the United States. 
And when it came time to pick my National History Day project for this year, I thought that this would be something that I'd be interested in exploring more and learning more about. One of the things I find uh, fascinating about it is the way you tied the Great Migration into other topics that we know well, white flight, privatization of resources, privatization of um, what uh, have been called white spaces. And I'd like to hear how easily you were able to tie the visuals to the both the interview with Ms. Scott and the textual uh, support that you were you were coming up with. And so just how did that flow together to make this a very local story that got you interested in in it to the the national story that it really is? I think one of the most difficult parts of this project was kind of figuring out where to like start and where to stop on the timeline of history. And so I really wanted to start with the Great Migration, you know, the rise of Jim Crow. And this is kind of when Northern attitudes began to resemble those in the South with, you know, segregation and exclusion kind of becoming um, like the rule of thumb for housing, employment, education, basically every single aspect of life. And I think that I kind of wanted to make sure I was hitting all of the um, key events that took place surrounding the civil rights movement and um, and that type of thing. And I want to make sure that I was giving enough context for my for my audience. And I thought that starting with the Great Migration was kind of the really the right place to start to be able to give co the context that led up to those events. The interview with Ms. Scott was incredibly powerful. Um, and I'd like to ask how you developed that relationship uh, to, to get her to help you tell the story that you were trying to tell. Um, Ms. Scott um, lives very near me and she also um, works, used to work in my community. She's retired now, but she was a um, recreational teacher at a school that I actually train at for um, sports. And so that's kind of how I came in contact with her. And I actually interviewed three different people for this project, but I thought that I kind of wanted to make sure that I was giving enough time for Ms. Scott to speak because I thought that her career, her life experience was the most interesting and kind of what I connected with the most. What are some of the things that through your research surprised you the most and you were the most excited to include in the documentary? I think there were a lot of things that I was like really surprised with. Most of the stuff that I was learning about this was very new because, you know, in school we haven't really been taught about how important the fight was to reclaim recreational spaces in the civil rights movement, how it was one of the last steps to desegregating American society, how it was one of the last um, places to be desegregated in the courts. Um, I think that what was really interesting was just kind of to learn how important the fight to reclaim recreational spaces really was, because it's just something I really didn't know anything about. When looking at public spaces and uh, desegregation around them, what were some of the most effective uh, means to, uh, what were the most effective ways to, to, to win that fight? I think that even today, the fight hasn't been completely fought. I think that there's still a lot of things that need to happen to kind of change the legacy that's kind of been left behind from these events. So during um, during this time period and in the 1950s and the 1940s, a lot of um, privately owned African-American swimming facilities were kind of being um, taken over by white businesses, white communities. They were either being bought out or they were getting closed down by these white communities and these white businesses. And so this kind of left a legacy of um, exclusion and segregation because people, what I learned from my interviews was that people are more likely to go to pools 
if they have a connection to the person who's owning it. And so a lot of these white communities and white businesses, after they bought out these privately owned African-American swimming facilities, a lot of African-American families stopped attending pools or swimming facilities. And I think that even today it's left behind a very substantial legacy that really hasn't been fully overcome yet. I think the thing that I liked the most about your documentary was that it does end on a, a note of hope. And you talk about uh, Olympic gold medalist teaching swimming, the sorority sisters who are trying to regain, because it's not just about recreation space, it's also a public health issue. Some of the statistics that you had with um, African-American children drowning were, were quite stark. And do you see hope uh, for for this topic in the future? I think that there are steps that can be taken to help um, like kind of undo the legacy that's been left behind. And it's not just that, that um, drowning rates for African-American children are elevated. It's also the fact that um, they are less likely to have convenient access to public or private pools, they are less likely to be depicted in media, engaging out in outdoor and recreational activities. I think that there's so much to overcome that that's still being fought today. And I think that there are things that can be done. Um, I just think that one thing that we can do is to be supporting these privately owned African-American swimming facilities to get more people in the water to get more people swimming safely. And I think that more funding needs to be given to these privately owned African-American swimming facilities so that they can expand and just get more people in the water. Thank you, Abigail, for a very moving story and very informative uh, and congratulations on your award. Thank you. As we bring the curtain down on this film festival, we hope that you've been inspired and moved by the incredible talent and creativity of these young filmmakers. If you wish to relive the magic of any of these films, explore the award document award-winning documentaries from previous years, learn the art of crafting your own American history film, or dive into the wealth of educational resources thoughtfully curated by the Philadelphia Film Society, head over to thebetterangelssociety.org slash NGAA. Before we part ways, I want to take a moment to express our heartfelt gratitude. This festival wouldn't have been possible without the support and collaboration of some exceptional organizations and individuals. A special thanks to the Philadelphia Film Society for hosting the fifth annual Student History Film Festival, proving, providing a platform for these brilliant minds to shine. Thank you to the Better Angels Society and National History Day for making this prestigious award possible, recognizing and encouraging the remarkable talent displayed by these young filmmakers. A special shout out to the Library of Congress and Ken Burns for their invaluable contributions in creating and promoting American history documentaries, preserving our rich heritage for generations to come. And a massive thank you to each and every one of you in our audience. Your presence and enthusiasm have made this event truly special. By watching and appreciating these films, you've shown your support for the budding historians, filmmakers, and artists of our future. Last, but certainly not least, congratulations to Maya, Jay, Elena, Yelena Rose, Shay, and Abigail. Let's continue to celebrate the power of storytelling, of history, and of creativity in all its forms. Thank you for being a part of this cinematic journey with us. Stay curious, stay passionate, and keep using your voice to tell the stories that matter to you. Goodbye, and we hope to see you next year at the Next Generation Angels Award 6th Student History Film Festival. Thank you to the Library of Congress for its archives and resources. To Ken Burns for inspiring us to make great history documentaries. To the Better Angels Society for recognizing us with this awesome award. 
to National History Day, for recognizing our projects, to our teachers and parents for their unwavering support, and, of course, thank you to Patrick Middling for being a great host.